Thank you and good morning. Well, uh, I've been told by Jim Lakely that everybody is in a very narrow time limit, so I'm going to speed through this. I've got a number of slides. So let's start. What is gatekeeping? Well, it, the definition is the process through which information is filtered for dissemination, whether for publication, broadcasting, the Internet, or some other mode of communication. And we're going to talk about that. In the climate de debate, who are the gatekeepers? Now, I'm going to focus mostly on number one, the data set curators. NOAA, CRU, the Climate Reference Unit at the University of East Anglia, NASA GIST, BEST at Berkeley, UAH, uh, Dr. Roy Spencer represents, and RSS, Remote Sensing System, the two satellite, uh, satellite data sets. There's the science journals, Nature, Nature Climate Change, for example, others, the press release services such as Eureka Alert, and then there's the IPCC. The most famous example of climate data set gatekeeping came from Phil Jones at the Climate Research Unit in an email to Warwick Hughes in 2005 on February 21st. I should warn you that some data we have are not supposed to pass on to others. We can pass on the gridded data, which is their modified data, which we do, but even if the World Meteorological Organization agrees to this, I will still not pass on the data. We've got 25 years or so invested in the work, so why should I make the data available to you when your aim is to try and find something wrong with it? <laughs> that is the basis of science. Science should be self-correcting. This is a failure of science in the highest degree in what he said. A lot of people don't know that climate data, at least a surface temperature record, is actually single source. Uh, people have this idea that some of those other acronyms that I threw out are actually separate data sets. Well, they are, but they all originate in one place. NOAA's NCDC, which was now renamed NCEI, or the National Center for Environmental Information, is in charge of collating and presenting the entire world surface temperature data set. Their data collation and adjustment methods have never been fully replicated outside of that organization. Again, something that science holds dear. Replication has not been done. So there's two types of data sets. There's the surface temperature data set measured by thermometers about two meters above the surface, and then there's the independently derived satellite temperature data, which Dr. Spencer will talk about after me. <laughs> the surface temperature data set all comes from NCDC. They are the sole source, and the Climate Research Unit, NASA GIS, BEST, all get their data sets from that one source. And then they do their own special things to them, so they're not really independent. The UAH and RSS get the same satellite data, and they interpret it differently and do their own different algorithms, but they tend to have a lot of agreement. The single source surface temperature data tends to agree no matter who presents it. Because of this, it's all single source. It comes from NOAA's NCDC, and you can see a fair amount of agreement there. But what does not agree is the surface temperature record measured by thermometers versus the satellite record. And that little mark there, that a satellite data period, is the same space as the graph over on the right. One shows a rise, and one shows essentially a flat trend. That's a big difference. And in fact, the satellite temperature data are now widely diverging from the surface temperature data. Here we have a comparison of NASA GIS and the RSS data set. And as you can see, the divergence is growing. So if they're supposed to be measuring the same thing, why the divergence? That's a big question in science right now. Data sets are presented as anomalies. And this is one from NASA GIS. And as you can see in the far upper right, there's the pause up there that well, everyone's been talking about. But you never see it presented this way. Now, this is what the actual data looks like if you plotted it on the scale of human understanding and experience. If you plotted the actual temperatures like you'd see them on a thermometer and write them down and do the average for the year, this is what it would look like, essentially flat on the scale of human experience. There's a slight increase you can see from left to right, and there's some, some variation from year to year. But in terms of human experience, we couldn't really ourselves easily detect global warming. It's, it's so small within our scale of experience and sensory perception, we couldn't really detect it if we didn't have these tools to extract and magnify it like some of these data sets do. And one of the things about the ways anomalies are presented is that it's not a real measurement of the Earth's temperature. Dr. Gavin Schmidt of NASA GIS in a recent essay on real climate said, global temperature anomaly estimates are a product not a measurement. The first thing to remember is that an estimate of how much warmer one year is than another in the global mean is just that, an estimate. We do not have direct measurements of the global mean anomaly. Rather, we have a large database of raw measurements and in individual locations over a long period of time. 
But with an uneven spatial distribution, many missing data points, and a large number of non-climatic biases varying in time and space. And that's the real thorny problem with the surface temperature data set, all these biases which they try to correct for. And the question is, are these biases doing more harm than good? Data sets are highly adjusted and infilled. And adjustment, by definition, is a small alteration or movement made to achieve a desired fit, appearance, or result. I think that applies to what we've seen in climate science. Part of the gatekeeping of data sets is through the application of adjustments to past data. Sterling spoke of that in his introduction. Here you can see NASA GIFs as it's plotted over different years in 1980, 1987, 2007, 2010, and 2015. And the important thing to note here is that the past starts diverging. The temperatures of the past are changed. It's almost like Winston Smith at work here. We've got differences in data that had been measured now diverging. What's going on? Well, these are all due to adjustments. The temperature reported years ago just isn't the same as what it is reported today. This is a flipbook chart showing U.S. temperature. And notice the two circled green peaks there. This is from uh, Tony Heller. And you can see that the peaks have changed. And this is two different this is the same data set from two different years. How then can we determine what the real temperature trend has been if the data keeps changing from under us? And then there's another problem. A lot of the surface temperature record is infilled. Now, there are thousands of weather stations around the United States. These weather stations are run by a lot of volunteers. Some are just people that are doing it in their own backyards. Uh, as part of the Cooperative Observer Network. Some are at police stations, fire stations, and so forth. But the thing is, is that a lot of these have disappeared. A lot of them have stopped reporting. And what's been happening is that NOAA has been increasing the infill, the interpolation between stations that have dropped out. And according to Tony Heller's analysis, there's now almost 40% of an infill going on. I think that estimate might be a little bit high, but the fact is, is that there is some infill going on in the surface temperature record. So instead of dropping these stations, they try to interpret, interpolate the data as if the station was there. It seems to me to be kind of a, um, a manufactured result. So the problem stems not just from adjusted and missing closed station data, but from the insistence of NOAA and CDC on using obviously bad data, such as stations like the following. This is from my surface stations project. This is the University of uh, Arizona at Tucson. This is their weather station in that little cage down there. It's in the middle of a parking lot. And the reason it ended up there was because the university kept growing and growing. It used to be in a grass field away from the campus, but the campus kept growing and it had a limited land grant. And they kept having to move the weather station. And finally, they put it right out in front of the Atmospheric Sciences Department. Now, when we discovered this and we reported on it, the station closed within about six months. NOAA closed it because obviously it was reporting the temperature of a parking lot rather than representative of the area. Here's another station not too far away in Carefree, Arizona. Now they have the NOAA official MMTS temperature sensor. This is run by a volunteer observer. But you can see it's, it's measuring the temperature basically of a large asphalt parking lot. Now we discovered this station because of a tool that used to be on a site called Hamweather and they would plot the daily highs and lows. And this one stood out in the middle. Look, look at that one little red dot in the middle of a sea of blue and purples and some oranges there. And we wondered why that one set a record and none of the others. Well, when we investigated, we found out it was measuring the temperature of a parking lot, and that's why. Another gatekeeping issue is that the public has only shown the average temperature, losing important information that tells us about the root causes of temperature change. For example, let's take a numbers lesson from Las Vegas, numbers capital of the world. Lower right is a graph of population for Clark County, which is, of course, Las Vegas. And as you can see, it's been rising almost exponentially. It looked like a hockey stick almost. <laughs> well, this is what the average annual temperature looks like for Las Vegas since 1937. And this data is from the National Weather Service website in Las Vegas. This is not something I plotted. This is their graph. And this is what we would normally see presented to the public, the average temperature. But there's some interesting things inside of this. This is what the average annual maximum temperature for Las Vegas looks like. It's flat or actually slightly decreasing over time. So it's not gotten hotter during the day in Las Vegas, but it has gotten warmer at night in Las Vegas. 
And the reason is the heat sink effect. The heat sink of all of that asphalt, concrete, and buildings, and the sun beats down during the day, it releases that at night as infrared, and that warms the air near the, uh, the surface, and that affects thermometers that are measuring the temperature at night. So clearly the warming is all in the overnight minimum temperature. And in our 2012 early release of our paper, we found this to be true with compliant and non-compliant stations. The two stations that I showed you pictures of are not compliant by NOAA's own siting rules. But when we look at the raw class 1 and 2 compliant stations, they have a trend of 0.182. The ones that are non-compliant have a trend essentially almost double that. And the NOAA adjusted data is also almost essentially double that. My premise is, why are we keeping all of these bad stations in the record? Let's just look for the best stations and use those as the metric to measure temperature change. And if it was getting warmer, we would expect to see increases in the number of record highs. We have not. This is uh, state record highs by decade. And as you can see, recent times haven't set any new state record highs. In fact, most of them were set back in the Dust Bowl area. And the number of 90 plus degree readings at all U.S. historical climate network stations has been going down. So um, it was mentioned about Carl 2015 paper that came out this past week. They needed the pause that everyone talked about to go away because there's a divergence between observation and IPCC's prediction. And so they did. This is what NOAA presented last week to the public. And they dumbed it down. They made it a couple of arrows. Look, these arrows now match. The global warming has disappeared. That, that's dumbing down for the public. And they did it by using an obscure and problematic sea surface temperature data set. On my blog, Michael Snappenberger and Lindzen wrote, as has been acknowledged by numerous scientists, the engine intake data, and this is where they're getting the temperature measurements from or water intakes on uh, ships, can be polluted by the ship itself, by the engine. The water coming out of sewage or the engine outlet can be affecting the temperature data. And Dr. Judith Curry also said that basically they ignored the Argo data, the, what was supposed to be the best measurement. They didn't include that at all. They ignored it. So basically they ended up doing uh, a little bit of trickery. They did some cooling of the past. Bob Tisdale and I on our website, what's up with that, showed this last week. They cooled the data before the hiatus to make the warming look stronger. But it really didn't do anything because when you compare it to the model project projections, it's still a very, very small percentage of warming, 2.4 percent. And then there's still the balloon data sets, the radiosons, and the satellite data sets which are diverging from the predictions. That's still a problem that they have not been able to explain. And a little bit of a side note, the U.S. isn't the world. We're often lectured that, but I want to show you that a pause exists in the United States. This is something you won't see reported on network TV or in the New York Times or in the Washington Post. The Climate Reference Network, the U.S. Climate Reference Network, was a pristine, state-of-the-art, technologically advanced network of about 150 stations set up around the United States, away from human civilization, to make an accurate assessment of climate change. We don't see this listed in the reports that NOAA puts out on a monthly basis about uh, their records and so forth. But I wanted to show you this plot from NOAA. This is from their website. And NOAA provides the same data in a tabular form, which I plotted again this morning. For the United States, we not just have a pause, but a slight cooling. And so it's at least in complete conflict with what NOAA has been saying last week. Yes, the U.S. is not the world, but it has the best observing network in the world. So this should be some pause for concern. So in summary, we've got the temperature record a victim of gatekeeping activity since its production methodology is not fully reproducible outside of the government. We need a third party investigation. The surface temperature record has an overzealous adjustment scheme that adds warming. The resultant temperature data set is, in my opinion, not fit for purpose and not truly representative of the temperature history of the globe or the United States. And the recent Carl et al. 2015 paper was a desperate attempt to remove the pause from the narrative but it still remains in the satellite radio sun and USCRM data. Thank you very much. Please visit my website. <laughs>